Hi everyone, welcome to Nexus of Thought. Today we're going to talk about why do satellites have circular orbits? Now not all satellites have circular orbits, many of them have elliptical orbits, but we'll get into that detail in another video. Today we're going to talk about satellites with circular orbits. So there's an example of a satellite. Now the reason why a satellite has a circular orbit and this is also a factor that comes into play with elliptical orbits as well, is the interaction of two phenomena. The first one is Newton's law of universal gravitation. So Newton's law of gravity, one of the great milestones in the history of physics, says that every object in the universe attracts every other object with a force of gravity, and that force is directly proportional to the product of the masses of each object, and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between each object's center of mass. So there is Newton's law of universal gravitation, because it's believed to hold true across the universe, written, uh, so it's F is equal to G, big M, little m over R squared. Big G is what we call the universal gravitation constant, and it was first determined by Henry Cavendish, an English experimental physicist, to be 6.673 times 10 to the minus 11 newtons. I don't believe he was as, as accurate as that. Now we know it down to about uh, the fifth or so decimal place. But it's one of the great constants of the universe. Big M is the mass of one object, uh, normally the larger one we use, and little m is the mass of the smaller object. So when we do it for this example, I'll use big M for the planet and little m for the satellite. R is the distance between the center of masses for each. And note that the force is attractive. So it's an attractive force. Also worth noting is that the force is an inverse square law. And you see these inverse square laws all over in physics. It's a consequence of the geometry of space. Coulomb's law, which I will talk about in another video, is another example of an inverse square law. So that's the first concept we have to think about, Newton's law of universal gravitation. The second concept also is also associated with Newton, and it's called Newton's first law. And it says a body will remain at rest or continue moving along a straight line at constant velocity unless it is acted upon by an external unbalanced force. And the reason for this is that a body has got mass, and mass is a property called inertia, and inertia is that property of matter that resists a change in motion. Now, we often associate this with this idea of inertia with Newton, but the idea actually comes from the great Italian experimental physicist, the father of experimental physics, Galileo Galilei. And there's a picture of the great Italian scientist who deserves a lot more credit for this. Newton articulated more into the form that we've used, and this, of course, was published in his book, Principia. So we've got two ideas that we're going to play off. Newton's law of universal gravitation, as well as the first law of motion, which is driven by inertia. So here we have a picture of a satellite in motion, and you can see that the satellite tends to go around. Uh, this is an artificial satellite. They normally have uh, circular orbits. And uh, so the tendency for the satellite is to want to go off at a straight line like this with a velocity arrow V. And that's because of Newton's first law of motion. So if the planet had to disappear, the satellite would just go zooming off at a tangent like that. However, there's another force that's at play as well, and that's the force of gravity illustrated by this green arrow over here. So you have the tendency of the satellite to want to veer off at a tangent. You have the force of gravity acting perpendicular to it. And the net effect is to produce a centripetal force. And that will result in the object moving in a circular orbit. So this was the great idea behind the Newtonian synthesis. He, he brought together Galileo's idea of inertia, or inertia in motion, which is what we'd associate with the red arrow, as well as gravity, and was able to show that this explains why, let's say, the moon goes around the Earth. The data actually Newton worked with was data for the moon around the Earth. Now, of course, we can use the same 
analysis for planets going around the sun. We can also use the same analysis for stars going around the galactic core. So it's a very, very powerful idea. But we're going to focus largely on satellites in orbit. So the combination of the force of gravity and the inertia is what's going to produce this motion. Here's another view of it. You can see that at each point the object is tending to want to go off at a tangent. But this net force being supplied by gravity has got other ideas. And at the end of the day, it's going to be going around in a circle like this. So if you equate, if you equate, I should actually put a line there. If you, oops, um, <laughs> if you equate Newton's law of universal gravitation uh, with the, and you said that is actually supplying the centripetal force, which is mv squared over r. If you equate those two, you can cancel out little m, which is the mass of the satellite. I should actually have made that the mass of the satellite. Yes, the mass of the satellite. It's amazing how you actually sometimes notice these typos just when everything is getting, uh, when you're just making the, the video. <laughs> okay, so the, little m is the mass of the satellite. We can cancel that out. Big M stays there. We then rearrange this equation and we solve for V. So you can see that this comes down to V is equal to the square root. That's what point raising something to the point 0.5 is of big G, M is the mass of the planet, and R is the radius of, orbit, of orbit. So it's divided by R. Please note, this is where a lot of people make mistakes. They assume that the radius of orbit is the distance from the satellite to the surface of the planet. It's not. It's the distance of the satellite to the center of the planet, all right? So that would include the radius of the planet, in this case Earth for most of our artificial satellites, as well as the height that the satellite is above the planet. But R is the distance always to the center of the planet. So from this formula, formula you can see that as R increases, V decreases. So the further a satellite is away from the center of the Earth, the smaller the speed it needs to work at. So the closer the satellite is to the center of the Earth, the faster it has to move. And that makes sense because the closer the satellite is to the center of the Earth or to the surface of the Earth, uh, the more the tendency of gravity to want to pull it downwards. So it needs to have a higher speed to counteract that tendency. So this is a useful formula that you can employ to determine the speed of a satellite in orbit. And note, it doesn't depend on the mass of the satellite. It just depends on the mass of the body being orbited as well as the radius of orbit. So then we can take that formula over there and uh, we can rearrange it. This is pretty neat. We can rearrange it uh, so I can square both sides. And when I square both sides, the square root disappears. I get V squared is equal to GM divided by R. I then replace with V, since V is your speed, I replace it by 2 pi R divided by T, big T. Big T is the period of orbit. It's the time that it takes the satellite to go around once. And uh, pi, of course, 2 pi R is the circumference of the orbit. So your circumference divided by the period is equal to the speed. Square that. And then I rearrange this, cross multiply. You can do this as an exercise at home. And I find out that I get R cubed, so the radius of orbit cubed, divided by the period of orbit squared, is going to yield this, what looks like a monstrosity on the right-hand side, but it's actually a constant for the planetary system. Big G is a constant, 4 pi squared is a constant, and M is the mass of the planet, which is constant for that system. So this is constant for all satellites orbiting the planet. So if you know the radius of the satellite orbiting the planet, then you know what the period of orbit is going to be. So it's, it's quite a, a useful idea. Galileo derived the same equation, uh, not Galileo, Kepler derived the same equation uh, a while back, actually, when studying the motion of Mars around the sun. Okay. One last thing before we end this video is the idea of the geosynchronous satellite. Just thought I'd talk about it because it plays quite a big role today.
So sometimes what we can do is we can place a satellite in geosynchronous orbit. And uh, this is neat because what it means is that the period of revolution, in other words, the time that it takes the satellite to go around once around the planet, is equal to the time that it takes the, the planet to rotate once around its axis. So in the case of Earth, this would be 24 hours. So it takes the satellite 24 hours to go around the Earth. The Earth rotates once every 24 hours around its axis, roughly speaking. And so the net effect of such an outcome is that the satellite stays directly above a given spot on the planet at all times. So if you place the satellite above New York, it stays above New York. And this is indeed very useful for GPS satellites where you need to make use of uh, these stable satellite positions for triangulation and things of this uh, idea. So again, geosynchronous satellites are placed for Earth. They have roughly an orbit, a time of orbit for 24 hours, of 24 hours. They're quite high up. They're about six or seven Earth radii above the Earth's surface. So they have to be very, very high up, much higher than the International Space Station. So that is it for today. If you like this video, please give it the necessary uh, like. And uh, if you're interested in subscribing, I would really much appreciate it. Planning to make more in the future. Keep well.